Right, we're down at the uh, bottom of the hour and we have our next uh, uh, presenter. Exactly. Brandon, and Brandon, you're gonna have to kick me, but uh, you need to preface, preface. I wanna have trouble all day remember, uh, pronouncing your name. <laughs> 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 to to be fair, uh, most most folks at CyberArk just call me BT, but it's uh, it's Trappenstedt. It's uh, it's just just German enough to, okay. uh, to be a little funky. Great. Uh, do you have a video, or you don't, you don't want to share? It's up to you. Yeah, I'm getting it getting it started now. Okay. We'll uh, we'll see if it's working. Um, I've internet's been kind of strange today, so there's a chance that if I try to share, okay. I'll I'll lose some audio stuff. So I tell you what, we'll. We'll keep off video for now, because um, it's probably better that way that people don't have to look hey, at me. Hey, uh, we're, we're making decisions as we move along, just like uh, Andy just mentioned, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, okay, so, up, yeah, well, Brandon, BT, if I can <laughs> call you that, uh, we're gonna know about you. So Brandon serves as a technical advisor and subject matter expert on privileged access and securing emerging technologies with over 10 years in the combined spaces of information security, software de development, and systems engineering. Brandon has architect security solutions for some of CyberArk's largest global customers. CyberArk is actually one of our proud sponsors. Thank, Thank you. you for supporting this initiative. Thank you so much. So, Brandon, welcome to Tactical Edge. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and, and for the invite to be here. It's, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, so over the next few minutes, uh, we've curated uh, uh, some transformative content for you. Transformative not because it, uh, it will shift in the middle, but because we'll talk a little bit about this uh, beautiful rainbow that is organizations move to the cloud. Um, we'll also talk about, uh, in addition to all the great things that the uh, that the cloud and that uh, uh, ephemeral uh, computing and all that good stuff brings, uh, some things to be focused on around our security posture. Some of the shifts that we've seen in uh, uh, attack flows and attacker mindsets and all that good stuff as it relates to this ever dissolving perimeter that we all keep uh, hearing about. But before we dive in, uh, just a quick note on CyberArk. And I tell you this because uh, my viewpoint's gonna be a little bit biased in that CyberArk's only goal is to protect privileged identities, to uh, make sure that the keys to your proverbial kingdom, which continue to be distributed on-prem in the cloud and in the middle, are secured, uh, rotated, are uh, uh, isolated and monitored for full attestation, all that good stuff. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about the journey that we've made in uh, the last 20 years we've been around from the old school mechanisms of securing things like uh, uh, built-in on-prem accounts, domain admin, UID zero accounts, all the way to all this good stuff that's happening in the cloud. Um, so why though? Why are your organizations moving to the cloud? Well, I imagine many of you are thinking, well, it's because uh, it allows us to be more agile with the delivery of our software or of our services. Uh, it allows us to uh, continue to evolve our technology and internal processes too, or it saves us money. Uh, infrastructure for you on-prem may be at a premium these days, where if you stick it into one of the cloud service providers or your own private cloud, you may see cost savings there. Uh, and of course, one of the biggest reasons to move any and all services to the cloud and uh, to more containerized uh, um, uh, outfits is the beauty that is modern automation. Uh, I remember years ago when we were standing up virtual machines, we got excited if we could write a script that stood up 10 virtual machines in like 10 minutes. That was the coolest thing ever. And that was all the, the Red Hat kickstart stuff that happened. But nowadays, spinning up uh, 10,000 brand new containers uh, in a matter of seconds, that's like so, uh, so uh, 2018. But we're seeing this lure of modern automation uh, happening both in our traditional on-prem workflows but also just being exponentially more neato in the, uh, in the cloud space. So all these good things are happening. Uh, organizations are shifting. Cyber 
for Arc ourselves, we uh, we started as a very on-prem focused platform. Around six years ago, our customers began saying, listen, CyberArk, uh, we're moving uh, a lot of our infrastructure to the cloud. You need to be there too. So we said, okay, we'll be there. We'll, we'll help you secure those environments. Whereas these days, many of our new processes and capabilities are uh, cloud-born. Um, our uh, founder and CEO, uh, Udi, uh, said it best when he said that CyberArk year over year is becoming more and more sassy. S uh, double A S Y and uh, and I stole it from him. And I'm going to keep using it until. But it's true. Uh, many organizations are um, software vendors as well as your platforms too. Uh, but as we make this shift, um, one of the things that continues to remain the same. Whoops, too far. Is that privilege is everywhere. Um, whether it's the on-prem stuff uh, like the UID zero and root accounts, your database credentials, your domain admin accounts, things like that to infrastructure as a service, all those virtual machines that are now running in your AWS, Azure, GCP, et cetera, environments. Um, so we're seeing these privileged access elements moving all around, right? Uh, um, but the interesting part here is uh, we're seeing an exponential increase in non-human privileged access, fueling all of that automation that I mentioned a moment ago, we have more machines and then robots and scripts and uh, pipelines that are leveraging powerful access. It's not like Skynet is taking over or anything like that from Terminator, but five years ago, we typically saw for every one privileged person, that is someone with above average rights or uh, using accounts that make your stomach turn a little bit if you think about them being compromised, um, for every one of those humans, there were five non-humans, robots, machines, scripts that had the same types of rights. These days, I dare say the non-humans have increased to the tune of one to 10, one to 20, one to 50 in certain organizations. And automation is king, but it uses privilege. So for us and for you, when looking at how to make sure this access is properly managed, properly attested, that these secrets aren't just sitting all over the place, Consistency is absolutely key. And I'll talk more about that concept here in a moment. Um, I'm a, a very simple person, if, uh, if many of you haven't noticed it already. And as a simple person, I tend to use metaphors to uh, help my brain to understand concepts that many of you likely have no, uh, no challenge uh, getting right away. But when we look at the way attackers work, the old school way of doing things, you see that on the left was if I wanted to compromise an environment, whether that be for uh, disruption, uh, information uh, gathering, so exfiltration of data or any number of reasons, the process I would use would be something like this. I would uh, target a particular set of users, uh, compromise the uh, access of that user through phishing, look at ways I can elevate privileges in the environment, then begin to move laterally to other systems that would give me more and more access with more powerful accounts, finally compromising the creamy nougaty center of the organization. Used to be the, uh, the Active Directory domain. Um, now that was a process that uh, we used to see all the time. We still see it today, but if you look at the right, attackers are uh, becoming more and more savvy to the fact that environments are incredibly distributed, that the perimeter is uh, completely dissolved, right? We've been talking about perimeter dissolved for five years, but uh, it's happened, it's done, to where these days, from the comfort of my mom's basement, I promise you I don't live in my mom's basement, I moved out two weeks ago, as an attacker, what I can do is compromise one user just like before, but if that user has overprivileged access or just privileged access into our cloud environments, that's it, I'm done. I don't have to move laterally anymore. I don't have to elevate privileges because of the centralized nature of cloud computing. I've got what I need and can perform compromises. We've seen this in the news more and more uh, over the last couple of years, the most recent being a uh, case of a financial services institution who uh, had an improperly configured and overprivileged web application firewall rule. That rule or uh, role gave them access, the attacker, to uh, not only the, uh, the network in the cloud, but also privileged uh, buckets or storage containers that allowed for the exfiltration of data. 
But the cool part here, not that attacks are cool, you've been in security too long when you get excited about this kind of stuff, is uh, neither of these are going away. Um, but you can uh, manage them in very similar ways. Um, for instance, the old school mechanism of land and expand, think of it as a bicycle. It's got a chain, it's got wheels, it's got handlebars. I wish it had one of those little uh, one of those little horns on the top. But in any case, it's we know what we should do here. We manage the secrets, we rotate them, we do things like strong authentication through multi-factor. Um, in the cloud, a lot of that still is true with a couple of additional considerations we need to make. Yeah, there are wheels there and there's a chain, I, I think, I think there's a chain on there, but uh, this thing moves a lot faster. It's a lot more powerful. So we have to approach it with uh, maybe a little bit more respect than we did for traditional on-prem flows. So that consistency play here is making sure that both of these proverbial bicycles are covered with some of the same uh, sort of processes, but just knowing uh, that we have to take a little bit more care on the cloud side. So where do you start, right? The, we know that attackers are looking at cloud processes. They're looking at the fact that code exists in public repos and that the cloud is by default, typically a pretty open place. Well, when we look at it from the privileged lens, every single one of your cloud service providers and of your accounts, subscriptions and projects inside has one ring to rule them all, a bad Lord of the Rings reference. It has one super powerful account at the very least. Uh, these are things like organization and account root in AWS, uh, stuff like global admin and then domain and limited admin in Azure, whether you're using Azure Active Directory or you have your on-prem directory being uh, available in Azure, as well as super admin and project owner in GCP. These are the scariest secrets that every one of these cloud services providers will tell you, you should only use if the cloud is literally on fire. Um, now, before I, uh, I was adopted by CyberArk, I, was, uh, I did a series of things on the R&D front, but at one point I was also a systems admin. And you could tell me, Brandon, you should not use the most ultra powerful account you can find. And my brain would say, okay, I shouldn't use it, but I know what I'm doing, so I'm gonna go ahead and use it. And these uh, service providers are very good about recommending that you don't. Uh, so when we look at these accounts, we see it as being the uh, easiest gateway for a threat actor if these are misused and compromised. I'll talk a little bit about what to do about these in a moment, but underneath each of these accounts, there are a series of other super powerful like secrets that can be used from IAM accounts in AWS that have the AWS admin role to privileged Azure Active Directory and GCP IAM accounts. These uh, typically don't have the same recommendations from the cloud services providers as your ultra powerful ones, but can be used by threat actors for equal negative gain. So when we look at these, first of all, we wanna make sure we approach things based on risk but also have the appropriate visibility into how our cloud teams happen to be working. Um, and I'll talk about that more, the concept of visibility more in a bit. So taking all of these things into account, what do you do? What can be done to lower the threat surface? Well, first thing, find them. Uh, if you don't know that these accounts exist, if you've not chatted with your teams responsible for digital transformation about how privilege is being initiated, have that conversation. Uh, uh, send them a, uh, an Uber Eats certificate for ice cream or pizza or something like that, but open up the dialogue. Uh, one of the biggest risks here is uh, not, not securing things properly, but not knowing that you need to secure things properly. Uh, there are solutions out there, both open sourced as well as provided free by platforms like CyberArk that help you enumerate things like cloud privileged accounts. Once you've found them, place them in a secure location. Uh, for all of those super ultra megazord powerful accounts, cloud service providers will typically say, hey, put multi-factor authentication in front of them. Uh, a lot of times uh, your cloud teams will do that. They may have a shared password that they use. They may put that secret into a safe, 
why use a physical safe when there are secure platforms out there that can store and then also integrate with things like your ticketing system. So if I want to access the root account, I need to put in a ticket or somebody's got to approve it, right? So put some additional ownership around these and the ones you can rotate, rotate. Some like AWS root are a little bit more complicated to rotate due to having MFA on top, but the moment you let a platform automatically perform rotation for you, you have either A, saved the person charged with rotating something like uh, you know, one, of, uh, one of our customers was looking, uh, they were brokering a thousand hours a year for cloud account manual rotation, a thousand hours just rotating passwords, save them time or add security if you're not performing rotation. And by the way, if at the very least, these super powerful uh, global admin or AWS root or project owner accounts don't have multi-factor, do that. Um, I imagine a number of you, um, most of you have multi-factor as part of your security program. Extend that as soon as you can into the cloud. It's very simple to set up and your service providers offer mechanisms to allow it to happen. Second thing, right? If you've got these stored somewhere, um, rotation is great, but sometimes it can't be done. But if you've got them stored and you've got people doing things like uh, requesting approval and checking them out, take another step and do things like isolate and monitor sessions using these powerful secrets. If I need access to a super privileged AWS root account, chances are you'd like to know what's going on when I leverage that secret because of just how much damage can be done. Likewise, you may deem it unnecessary to show me what that secret is. So click connect, connect through. Don't worry about uh, the user seeing a secret or the secret making its way to the end user system. Recording is great, but it tends to be a byproduct of isolation when you look at all the privileged access management platforms in there, uh, CyberArk included. And then finally, and this is my favorite, favorite part. Uh, so far, when we look at discovery and, and vaulting and rotation and management, these are all very reactive things. I got to know about something before I can, uh, I can take steps. Um, why not challenge the platforms you work with to become more proactive around security? Uh, for instance, many of you are likely leveraging a, uh, a SIM platform that's forwarding events from all over to your SOC. Uh, you may be using native stuff like uh, AWS CloudWatch or Azure Sentinel, right? You're seeing events that are happening in your on-prem and cloud domains. Wouldn't it be neat if, say, uh, credential was being used outside of your vault without your vault act being accessed first, that instead of your SIM or information or events platform in the cloud warning you, that could sync with say a vaulting pl platform that would then say, wait a minute, this is super, super weird. I do wanna let you know, but why not perform a rotation automatically? Cut off the potential attack flow as it's occurring versus waiting on your first responders to analyze the data, prioritize the data, and then, uh, and then perform remediation later. Um, this is an oldie but a goodie, but uh, back in uh, 2013, the Office of Personnel Management breach, uh, and again, 2013, right? Cloud was just starting to, uh, to really catch on then, uh, but the Office of Personnel Management had a breach. Uh, their information platform, events platform, caught every single step of the attackers, but it was buried under thousands of other events. So by being more proactive against weird behavior or doing things like automatic onboarding of all these privileged cloud secrets, we can help you prioritize to, all right, of those thousand events, here are the 10 that were weirdest that SOC teams should check out before they go to lunch today. And of those 10, working in unison, here are the three that your security platforms weren't able to perform automatic remediation on. So working more intelligently with the data rather than constantly relying on manual or human review, um, augment those processes whenever you can. Um, now I'll, I'll take a, a quick jaunt into another area. So far we've talked a lot about software as a service type access, uh, management console access, uh, uh, services access, stuff like that. But an even easier way to extend this concept of privileged access management into your cloud estate is looking at your infrastructure as a service. 
your EC2 instances, your Azure VMs, your GCP VMs, uh, uh, every single one of these new nodes that gets created has a built-in secret, just like stuff on-prem. Uh, there's no exception here. Uh, if I've got a, a Windows uh, virtual machine on-prem, it's got a built-in admin account. Same is true for a Windows VM running in the cloud. Uh, this is nifty uh, because you can manage it in the same way. Do things like uh, proactive uh, onboarding, vault these accounts, rotate them, isolate them, just as you would with on-prem stuff, but make a couple of tweaks. Um, if you're a company who's using multi-clouds, which is very common these days, uh, chances are you've got different islands of trust, right? So we manage our AWS VMs over here and our Azure VMs over here, and there's a different team. Uh, so this allows us to centralize that approach for all VMs in the organization, on-prem or cloud, manage, rotate. Here are the policies we've set, and here's the automated stuff to let it happen. Uh, look deeper into automating these things as well. Um, uh, there are a number of platforms out there, ours included, that can detect newly created VMs in your cloud, automatically onboard and rotate those secrets. Uh, so that automation here is absolutely key. But finally, look at least privilege and just-in-time models too. Just because I have access to a VM in the cloud doesn't necessarily mean I should be the built-in admin, just like on-prem. Uh, and if I'm spinning up tons and tons of new cloud virtual machines, why even worry right away about uh, giving access to the built-in secrets when users could be given just the right access, just the right time, and then removed later? Um, this could be using your native cloud estate, things like Azure PIM, or using platforms that integrate with those processes, like um, as a, for instance, uh, CyberArk. So uh, these things can be augmented, done together, but by planning for the need to automate, the need to instantiate just in time for our infrastructure, it's simply an extension of on-prem. Um, now, when we talk about these elements, we tend to go security first, right? The reason I'm doing this is because it adds security into my cloud. Many of our end users may not feel the same way about identity, security, attestation, entitlements, compliance, and uh, access control that we do. Uh, in fact, a lot of the users that you interact with day to day may have been doing some version of their workflows for the past 10 years. If we add in on-prem stuff like mainframe, chances are mainframe admins are out there who have been connecting in the same way for over 30 years. The reason I say this is because one of the things we need to focus on when we're looking at imposing security is the added benefit of providing operational uh, benefits to our end users. For instance, if I tell my users, okay, to access your cloud VMs or your cloud console, you'll need to go through an intermediary, a jump server. To add to this, I could say, and by the way, you can use your own native client. You can connect the same way that you connected before, but still we get all those security benefits of isolation and monitoring. So look for solutions and platforms that let Linux admins use their SSH shells uh, that allow uh, cloud administrators to just use their own browser with modified uh, username strings. So this has been a very, very big theme for user adoption over the past uh, uh, last half decade or so. And uh, coming from the Linux estate in the past, I can tell you that um, if PAM was enforced upon me and my old workflows, instead of grinning and bearing it, I would start looking for ways around because I believed that my personal workflows were being heavily impacted, which made me less efficient and less of an asset to the organizations that I was a part of. So always look for ways that native access can be done alongside your security. But those are humans, console access, infrastructure as a service, these things can be managed. But as you're considering these topics, as you're chatting with folks, if it's not something that you're already doing as part of your security practices, if I could ask you for one favor, and I realize you don't really owe me any favors, so it would be a big favor. Um, don't forget about those applications that I chatted about, all of the non-humans, the robots, the processes that every single day need privileged access to your on-prem and cloud estates. Uh, because if you do forget about them, what can happen is something like what you're seeing. Uh, this is a uh, public code repository, it's just GitHub. Uh, and uh, I've highlighted here a hard-coded 
Amazon access key secret key pair, um, Amazon will tell you that uh, you should not do this. And we completely agree. Uh, but sometimes accidents happen. It's not that our developers are malicious. It's just some of our code pushes may go to the wrong repositories, for instance, or we may forget when we're moving something from dev repos to prod repos. Um, and if you want to have some fun, again, this is the security focused version of fun, uh, pop on to GitHub. Uh, do a search for your favorite secret type. It could be what I have here, uh, Postgres, database secret, whatever. Just I mean, find a string that you like. Uh, search for that. Sort by recent code commits. And I guarantee you, or I'll stand on my head and eat a bucket of scorpions. I feel like that's like a, like a car salesman thing. But I guarantee you that within an hour, you'll find someone's privileged secrets sitting in plain text exactly like this one. So as we become more cloudy, so to speak, hard-coded secrets, secrets used by applications are a very, uh, a very strong reality. And attackers use tools like uh, a Truffle Hog, for instance, that do this searching for them automatically. So when we're looking at human stuff, keep in mind that applications are using those secrets too. And as you can imagine, apps can be handled in the same way. So once you find a secret like this one, whether it be automatically or uh, manually, or somebody just tells you about one in your org, well, step one, vault them, just like before, rotate them. Even if you rotate a secret used by an application one time, you've increased your security posture significantly. Um, once you've uh, started the process of vaulting these secrets, you'll need to give applications and scripts and robots and all that good stuff a way to access whatever vault you use and pull them out. But the thing about applications is they can't multi-factor like people. I couldn't just ask Jenkins, hey Jenkins, can you, uh, can you do a, a TOTP or can you grab your phone that doesn't exist because you're an application and click the approve button? Uh, no, in a lot of cases, when we secure secrets that applications use in a vault, the first inclination may be, well, I'll just give the application a secret that then lets it authenticate to a vault, and then it pulls the original secret. So I give an application a secret to authenticate and then pull a secret. So I just have another hard-coded secret. I've only done obfuscation by one layer. So one of the very common themes these days is, to let applications authenticate based on what they are, not what they know. Uh, CyberArk started doing this around 16 years ago with uh, those uh, monolithic on-prem J2EE application servers. But what we can look at is stuff like, uh, what is the application running as? Where is it running from? Does it have a role or a managed service in the cloud associated with it? Uh, is it this version of code that I've uh, whitelisted, for instance? So if that code changes maliciously, a secret's no longer available, all the way going down into your uh, platform as a service, your OpenShift and Kubernetes, looking at elements of the pod that the application has to be a part of. So multi-factor for applications, even though it sounds kind of crazy, is possible through attribute-based authentication. And then finally, just as before, make sure that the operational impact to your developers is minimal when you're enforcing security. Things like injecting secrets into the secret stores they may have been using, Kubernetes secrets, for instance, is possible, as well as a number of integrations that uh, vendors are putting together in the space. For instance, uh, you may say, well, we have vulnerability scanners. Most vulnerability scanners integrate with a number of vaulting platforms that let you replace those secrets without having to worry about code changes. This is extended drastically to robotic process automation, one of the most uh, uh, speedily growing segments in the automation space. Um, these folks here, Automation Anywhere, UiPath, Blue Prism, WorkFusion, Pega, Edgeverb, Antworks, they all use privileged secrets to go about automating things that humans would have done. So being able to allow them to communicate with a vault like CyberArk allows those secrets to rotate and doesn't cause undue stress on our automation engineers. So look for ways that you can enforce this security 
without needing to change code for a lot of your off the shelf apps. I'll, uh, I'll have a link to a spot where you can research more towards the end. Um, if you say, you know what, that's great, but our organization is really heavy into containerization and platform as a service, there are different ways that we can get the same types of value. I mentioned the ability to potentially push secrets into Kubernetes secret store. That's one of the ways to skin that proverbial cat. But when we look towards the future, uh, what you see there in the, uh, the diagram to the right is what CyberArk believes to be the next phase of application secrets delivery is. Rather than an application retrieving a secret from some secure location, what if an application was brokered automatically through a broker? That broker reached up to a vault, for instance, grabbed the secret and proxied the connection so that the app never knew what that secret was. So that even if I had a malicious developer, again, not saying that would happen, but we wanna plan for the, uh, the worst case, um, they wouldn't be able to see the secret even if they wanted to. Um, this model that I'm referring to here is uh, tied to an open source project called Secretless. It's something that the, uh, uh, the CyberArk team has, has built and continues to maintain along with the community and allows for no code changes, as we talked about a moment ago, but adding the ability to obfuscate a secret from an application altogether. Pretty cool stuff. Um, now, uh, I mentioned this is the first open source thing that I've shared with you. So I want to share with you one more um, because I imagine that uh, 30 minutes in, um, what's on many folks' minds are one of two things. One of those things could be, I really wish Brandon would just stop talking. Um, I'm hungry. I want to go get lunch. The second thing might be, okay, how do I start now? I might not have the budget or I might use something else or I might have other projects uh, that are in front. What else can I do? to help build some of this visibility. Um, and to answer that, I'm so glad that you asked but didn't ask, uh, we look deeper into some of the open source things that are available, but also uh, one of the themes in all recent breaches that continues to show up uh, over and over again, and that is the concept of cloud leased privilege. Uh, if we think about it, Every single one of our cloud service providers have pretty beefy, for lack of a better term, identity platforms. They give you the ability to create roles, to define them, to assign those roles to various identity. Uh, but if you're using multi-cloud, even if you're using single cloud, things have to be perfect uh, in order for us to be instantiating the appropriate lease privilege so that attackers couldn't take advantage of that access. Uh, Azure by itself has 5,000 different permissions that can be assigned to entities. If you're a three cloud organization, multiply that by three. We're talking about 15,000 different elements that can be assigned to any given identity at any given time. It's because of this complexity that, uh, well, partly at least, we're seeing a lot of these uh, misconfigured uh, roles being used by threat actors. Um, CyberArk has a part of our R&D team that we call labs. Uh, our labs group is responsible for researching and creating tooling to help with emerging threats. And uh, when we began to look at this type of data, we found this concept of a cloud shadow admin. I know it sounds kind of creepy because it is, but a cloud shadow admin is an administrative permission that doesn't necessarily look super powerful, but can be used for negative gain. For instance, some of the ones that you see here, we would consider to be cloud shadow admin. Uh, the use of wild cards, the ability to uh, change and redefine other roles, in addition to misconfigured roles altogether, like the web application firewall one I mentioned, can be used. Um, again, I mentioned earlier uh, my uh, propensity for thinking in metaphors. So when we look at these cloud shadow admins, uh, when we look at one straight on like we are here, it's pretty distinct. Um, as, as a kid, I'd say I was, uh, I was in a love-hate relationship with Where's Waldo. I loved the idea of finding Waldo, but then I often got frustrated. Um, this is actually Waldo's evil cousin who I didn't know until before I've created this presentation existed. But when you look at this fellow, he's pretty distinct. He's got uh, a bumblebee looking sweater on, he's got glasses, he's got a little mustache going on. Like it's this cloud shadow admin role is clear. 
But when we place this amongst all of the other potential permissions in the cloud, it starts to look like this. So once we began doing the research, we uh, challenged our labs team to put something together that helps you generate visibility of these shadow admins, uh, proverbial uh, bumpers to your bowling alley of cloud privilege. So for instance, I've thrown up some hair. You see uh, our uh, Waldo cousin guy up there in the top right, and then Waldo is actually hanging out down there in the bottom left. So our goal is to help you find these things. And to do that, uh, we've generated something you can start with right now. Uh, an open source utility called Skyarc that reaches out to AWS and Azure, uh, shows you information about cloud privilege, and then shows the different shadow admins that can be used for negative gain. It, uh, it's available on GitHub now, and it's a great way to start the conversation uh, on uh, what's going on in the cloud um, and have some additional, uh, for lack of a better term, backup when you're having those conversations if you're not directly responsible for identity in your cloud service providers. Um, now, it, to close out, all of these ideas, uh, the vaulting and rotation, the risk-based deployment models, the uh, reminder to remember our applications, uh, it's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of things that you could potentially do. Um, and you might need a little bit of direction. Um, I'll, I'll give you my last metaphor of the day. Uh, last week, um, uh, in, being working from home, I've been trying to eat healthier. So uh, uh, last week I decided I'm gonna eat a, uh, yeah, I'm gonna buy three pomegranates. I'm gonna eat them. Pomegranates are great, they're great for you. Um, but the thing about a pomegranate is uh, there are a number of different ways you can get the seeds out of the pomegranate. Uh, you can you know, take a wooden spoon, wrap it on the back, let the seeds fall out. You can soak the pomegranate and let the seeds fall up. You can do what I did and just kind of pick at the seeds until you get the ones you need. So all equally valid, but wouldn't it be super cool if there was some kind of international pomegranate association that told me, well, Brandon, here is the best way based on what you're looking to do to get the seeds out of that pomegranate. Now, pomegranates and privileged access, a little bit different, but over the years, CyberArk has worked with our customers and our partners and uh, has done uh, both best practices work as well as post-breach remediation to design a uh, solution agnostic blueprint for how to start, how to uh, deploy privileged access based on risk and make sure you're meeting your milestones in one set of recommendations that we call our blueprint. As I mentioned, the blueprint, while it was built by CyberArk, is agnostic. So you can do these types of things regardless of whether you use CyberArk or someone else, potentially. And it's something that we've been having conversations with our customers multiple times a day on. So yes, good ideas are good, but being able to execute on those ideas, to get the seeds out of the proverbial pomegranate, that's what makes a program like this one with uh, a number of considerations and environmental con uh, concerns um, far easier to deploy. So a couple of quick things to consider in summary, um, where all of our organizations are moving to the cloud, even if you work in a heavily regulated space, uh, um, whether it be uh, finance, whether it be uh, OT, uh, more and more processes are becoming uh, cloud-born or sassy, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, so plan for these types of things. Uh, look at ways to uh, develop visibility early on. Assume that you'll be using multi-clouds, even if you only uh, standardize on one cloud today. Uh, at the very least, start with your infrastructure as a service. It's just like on-prem. And don't forget your applications and also be mindful of cloud shadow admins. Uh, below uh, here under the free things to help column, I've got links to the Skyarc uh, utility that allows for that visibility, as well as open source technology for app secrets delivery, CyberArk's Conjure project, and that secretless broker that I mentioned to you. And then finally, if you want more detail about the blueprint, uh, uh, it's actually a really neat white paper that talks about the different steps. Feel free to head over uh, to grab that type of information. Uh, finally, um, if there is anything that you need, of course, we'll uh, we'll open it up for uh, uh, for, for Q&A and conversation now. But anything you need at all, please don't hesitate to hit me up. Even if you just want to say hi, uh, I'm just happy to receive emails sometimes. So uh, so thanks so much for uh, for taking this journey with me over the last 40 minutes or so. 
I'll uh, I'll turn it back over for for any and all uh, all conversation we'd like to have. Uh, great, uh, Brandon. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the the information. I have a question for you. Um, of course. So, based on the conversations, the presentations that we've had in the last couple of days, uh, we started with. Um, um, uh, Tony Cole from Ativo Networks, and he was recommending CISOs to read, you know, different uh, reports, industry reports. And uh, the one of the most famous ones is the uh, Verizon, right? And uh, and and in in there, it was identifying how there has been an increase in cloud in, in attacks to cloud solutions, and that was pre-COVID, correct? Then yesterday we had Wendy. Nather, fantastic presentation. And she said that CISOs now need to take a look at that, that information, understand the trends, and try to do their best to think forward in the future, where they think they're going to be, and then create solutions around that, right? Where they think they're going to be. But with that information, and, and you guys being cloud experts, where do you think CISOs should start thinking about in the next couple of years, two years, three years, from a security perspective to the cloud? Excellent question. And, uh, and there's two recommendations that I would make. Um, when, when we look at, at pre versus post COVID, in addition to a heightened number of, uh, of cloud-based attacks, there's also a heightened amount of successful attacks of opportunity. And what do I mean by that? Um, uh, in my office, I and I've counted the steps, I am uh, seven and a half, depending on where I'm standing, steps from the pantry. Uh, going to the pantry means I've got all kinds of great stuff, whether it be healthy or unhealthy, it's a distraction to me. Uh, you place that on top of uh, uh, families, for instance, of uh, looking outside the window and seeing the beautiful sunshine, uh, uh, these types of uh, distractions weren't always with us uh, when uh, we spent more of our time in offices. So I may be less mindful to focus on whether or not a link should be clicked. I may be less mindful regarding the secrets that I use, not only because I'm distracted, but because I'm distracted and everything else is going on. Um, so making sure that we're reminding our end users that uh, opportunity uh, attacks are out there while still looking at ways to give them the tools they need to proceed without all of the privilege they need ever is one of uh, the challenges that we'll see continue to grow over the years. And the second one, which ties in very closely to that, is more and more identities these days are becoming privileged. Um, whereas seven years ago, we may not consider that our marketing teams who are leveraging social media on behalf of the company were privileged. Nowadays, should that compromise occur, uh, at the very least, it can harm our organization's uh, image. Uh, and if we're in retail or a trusted advisor of any kind, image matters. Um, we're also seeing cases where uh, access to HR systems, for instance, or uh, not necessarily corporate hosted applications, but corporate shared applications are being used as a foothold. So while I focused a lot on the concept of privileged identity, what we're seeing happen and we expect to happen over the coming years is that the line between what is privileged and what is not will continue to blur as our organizations rely on more vendors, for instance, working from untrusted environments to more and more openly connected platforms that we use to communicate with our customer bases. So uh, when we look uh, forward to the next couple of years, in addition to cloud-borne attacks, uh, I imagine we'll see more and more non-privileged identities being elevated, but also used for negative gain. Yeah, it's, it's cloud, it's security is becoming extremely, extremely important. If it was already important, it's even more so nowadays. Um, in one of your slides, you showed uh, powerful console access. I love that slide because you showed for the three major or best known cloud providers, the, uh, the different type of accounts. Are these accounts there, from, uh, from a newbie perspective, are these accounts there, um, by default, can you change them? Can you rename them? Can you hide them? Or you cannot do anything about it? So they are there by default. 
Um, because we always have to start somewhere, just, just like with on-prem stuff, right? You yeah. stand up a Windows system, you have a built-in, but yeah. uh, uh, each cloud service provider provides recommendations on how to secure, but also how to leverage them. Uh, for instance, uh, while uh, renaming may not be possible, the first thing that should happen is placing multi-factor on them, right? making sure that uh, I must prove, in addition to knowing what the password is, that I, well, that I should have access to this secret. Um, where we see being a logical extension of that approach is management, rotation, isolation, and attestation. But at the very, very least, uh, creating a plan for multi-factor, but also in-band or out-of-band approval of access is uh, the first place to start. And the good news is many cloud teams will do this because of the best practices from the cloud service providers. So it may simply be a conversation of, fantastic, I'm so glad you're doing it. Um, now, how often is it being used, for instance? So yes, they, they are there, um, but they can be secured, even without needing an external platform. Okay. And, and nowadays, um, with everyone working remote, because that's the default standard, a lot of shadow, shadow IT in the cloud like crazy, correct? How, how does a PAM solution help control that? Or does it? It can. Uh, PAM solutions can help centralize the, uh, the IT operations. They can help you automatically bring things into management through uh, discovery or by leveraging APIs. But um, while a PAM solution can help with the security and the operational aspects, uh, the very first thing, uh, and it's, it's kind of fluffy, but it's something that we've seen be successful, is just having the conversation uh, having a chat with the teams, and it may be part of the uh, uh, the CISO's purview, it may fall under the CTO, but actually saying, are we taking processes to secure these elements? Um, so having the conversation is the very first step, but coming armed to that conversation with uh, uh, things like the Verizon report, but also uh, scanning that you've done in your environment, uh, programmatic steps that could be taken based on the blueprint stuff that I've mentioned, being uh, educated for the convo, uh, is also key, but um, before you begin solutioning, have the chat first to see where you are and where you fit, um, because uh, the good news is typically chatting doesn't cost uh, any uh, any of those funds that you may have reserved for other projects. Perfect, perfect, Brandon. Um, last question: Are you going to be in the CyberArk virtual room after uh, this presentation? Uh, yes, uh, yes, I'll uh, I'll be in, but we'll also have several other folks from CyberArk uh, ready and happy to answer any and all questions that you have. Perfect. So, Brandon, thank you so much for your time. Really, really appreciate it. Um, for everyone else, thank you for being here with us. Again, thank you to all our sponsors, uh, Ativo Networks, CellPoint, Exabeam, and, of course, CyberArk. Exactly. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Brandon, for your presentation. And everyone, remember, please, to visit our sponsor area to interact with our fantastic sponsors. They have prepared some special activities, and they have material that you can download. Yeah. So please uh, go and visit them. Yeah, and Brandon will be there, and uh, some other people from CyberArk will be there. And uh, just go ahead and ask uh, uh, questions and you know, take advantage of this opportunity. Um, and again, uh, half a day of Wednesday is over with, so we'll be back uh, 2 p.m. Central, Selma. Exactly. All we'll right. see you at 2 p.m. All right. Thank you Thank so much. You. Okay.